SJC 11985, Commonwealth versus Wilson. Ms. Pumphrey, good morning. Good morning, may it please the court. <clears throat> I'm Janet Pumphrey for Crozell Wilson. Um, I'd like to start, if I may, with the argument advanced by the Commonwealth um, that this court should adopt the good faith exception um, to the exclusionary rule as set out in basically United States versus Leon. Um, this court's never, under Article 12, this court has never, under Article 14, this court has never um, recognized a good faith exception. And I wanna argue and explain why it's a bad idea here. Um, to change this long-held uh, Massachusetts precedent under this particular case, um, I'd suggest that there's a very finite number of cases like this one. Um, the law changed with Augustine. Um, Augustine is applied retroactively, so this may, this may be the only case that this applies to. And so to go you know, beyond the precedent that you've made for basically what may just be one case is kind of extreme. Before you go there, what is extraordinary I think, maybe, about this case in terms of the 2703 application is that it was done orally. That's right. Uh, was it sworn? Do we know whether it was even sworn? I don't even think we know that. It was done in chambers. It was done orally. There's no recording. That's all. I think that's all we know. Uh, and certainly, if it, that were to be treated as a search warrant, that would not suffice. Exactly. And the, and the motion for new trial judge so found. Um, but if I could go on about, the, about changing the law with the good faith exception, um, Augustine is applied retroactively, and uh, if you changed um, the good faith exception in this circumstance, it would really go against your holding in Augustine, which uh, basically applies to cases just like this one that are on appeal during this time. Um, third, in the context of cell phone uh, location information, I think it's an especially uh, bad idea because um, this new technology just drastically changed, first of all, the government's access to very private information and also lowered the cost of government surveillance. Um, so that the reasonable expectation of privacy kind of takes on a new context in the, um, in the uh, context of uh, cell site location, I think. So but assume for the moment that we don't <laughs> that I can here. leave this. I could leave this here if you want. Uh, well, I'm not so sure of that, but I mean, okay. but the fact of the matter is Judge Rufo did not, Judge did Rufo not. basically yeah. said, well, if yeah. this were purely under federal law, the yeah. good faith exactly. exception would kick in, exactly. but it's not. Exactly. And then he made very, very detailed, very detailed. and careful yeah. findings. So why, why, are those, why is he not right? He's right in a lot of what he says. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what he says. Uh, two, two more issues on, and then I'll move on. Um, in the, the, also, my, my sister says that the overwhelming majority of other states um, recognize um, a good faith exception, but, uh, but uh, the, she's basically citing federal cases, and it is the federal law, but in Florida, I did a cursory search, and in Florida and also in uh, Connecticut, in this context of cell site location, um, there is no good faith exception. Um, as, a, as you said, Judge Rufo's findings were really, they were, they were, they were really excellent. I mean, they were, they were, um, they were comprehensive. They were, um, I agree with a lot of them. Um, what I disagree with primarily. Well, before you um, shift to the specifics, just it's nice to have sort of the dean of the bar weigh in on this good faith. So why, why is it a bad, because I haven't thought about it, unlike mm -hmm. two of my colleagues. So why isn't it a bad, why is it a bad idea generally? I know you're making specifics. But, you know, here the police are abiding by all of the exactly. current guidance. There's, they're actually behaving responsibly. So why, why generally should we not move towards the federal approach here? Because it's, again, I, I value your opinion. Yeah. Good. Get, well, go big picture for a second. Okay. I'm sure the chief will give you an extra couple of minutes. <laughs> the mm. bigger picture. Um, particularly, I think, with... Especially because the clock hadn't even started yet. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, I think that uh, mm. it, it, it's, a, it's a hard one because when the police act appropriately um, and, you know, in exactly what they should be doing under the law at that time, um, it's, it's, this is a hard one, but I think especially in this context of cell site locations, it, um, it just... Well, but I think Justice Kafka wants to go back to a bigger picture, exactly. which is the per what's the purpose of the rule? It's deterrence. It's deterrence. 
And, um, and perhaps, I mean, I might also say that it's perhaps police education in addition. Um, certainly in this. We'll focus that works with the <clears throat> Exactly, exactly. Um, and I think that uh, in this case, they, th there's really no deterrence um, because they, they really did what they thought was right. But so, okay, so there's, if the purpose of the rule is deterrence, but, but these are good cops abiding by the law, mm -hmm. I take it we, are, are you gonna make the secondary argument, look, there's still a constitutional violation, so. That's right. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. It's still a constitutional violation. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> well, this case really <clears throat> kind of turns on the, um, on the independent source uh, issue. <clears throat> um, the, uh, and as uh, Judge Rufo was, it was absolutely correct in, um, uh, in ruling that the, um, the CSLI search was legal under, under was illegal under Augustine, but um, incorrect that the admission of the CSLI was not constitutional error because um, the uh, information there could have been obtained by, um, was, uh, was, was sufficiently distinguishable to be purged by the, from the primary Well, date. what happened though, I, I think, is in 2014, mm -hmm. the, the information was still there, and, mm -hmm. and they went back and, and, and they got the CLSI. That's exactly right. And it came in at trial. That's exactly am, am right. I, am I correct it wasn't objected to at trial? It was a motion to suppress. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so you have the CLSI, mm -hmm. and you've got Judge Rufo's um, very careful analysis mm -hmm. of uh, the two states, August 3rd and August 5th. And then you look at Easterbrook. Mm -hmm. And I just um, wonder why um, the, that evidence is not enough independent of uh, the original CLSI. Mm -hmm. Well, I sort of see this case in two parts. One is the motion to suppress denial, and one is the motion for a new trial. And in my motion for a new trial, I asked that, um, I said that that trial attorney was um, ineffective for not trying to suppress other things. And that's really where Judge Rufo's decision is incredibly detailed. Um, and, and for the most part, it's very good. Um, when you get to the to the decision itself, the motion for new trial decision, he explains what was tainted, and he basically says what was tainted here were the um, in the August in the August third interview were the defendant statements to Detective York, defendant statements that he was where he was that night, um, the defendant's claim that he called Mo, that Mo is the Sanin guy, um, defendant's claim that he called J, uh, J D to sell him drugs. J D is the um, is the uh, oh, what is his name? Um, Wang? Wang. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, that he made a call. He, he was confused about the calls to his wife. I mean, it goes. Judge Judge Rufo goes on and on and on. This was all tainted. Okay. What was and in the August fifth interview, um, the claim that the, the defendant's denials that he was in Mashpee, the defendant's claim that he didn't remember a second um, a second call to his wife. But what was untainted, and uh, Judge Rufo believes that it should have come in. Um, was basically the, um, the defendant's action setting up a timeline, uh, Lang's, uh, Lang's, J.D. Lang's uh, statements, um, Sunin's statements, and um, the firearms registration data. Now some of this is hard to know exactly from the record that we have. The firearms registration data, if it's really from Lavoie's in, um, affidavit, it's hard to know exactly when they got that. Um, they knew, the police knew that um, that the defendant had a nine millimeter, and the police knew when they found the car that this was a 38 caliber um, partial projectile. Well, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of, of guns that will shoot, you know, not, it doesn't necessarily have to be a nine millimeter. And so when they went, and the police went to, um, you know, the, reg the registration and learned that his permit had been pulled for his gun, um, and the gun was never returned. And so they, they knew that. Um, so whether that should have come in or not, I, I question whether that should have come in or not. Sunin's statements, I, I think I'm should. sorry, you question what should have come in? The, the, the gun? Oh, no, just the, the, the information about the gun. There was no gun, but all the right. information about the gun. That, but, the, but, the, but they got that from public, from their own, from, 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 from the firearms records that they knew that he had. But did they, did they get the records before they interviewed him or not? Because at the, at the August 3rd interview, they asked him questions. How, how do you feel about guns? Do you have guns? And would they have asked that question if they didn't already know that he had a 9 millimeter? And if they already knew he had a 9 millimeter, you're saying that, that that was because of the CSLI? 
I mean, he clearly was under investigation. He was under investigation. Um, I'm just saying that when you, when you look at that August 3rd interview, after they already had the CSLI, they knew a lot about him. And um, did they know that? Did they know about the guns when they asked him about the guns? I mean, they used- What did they find the victim's body? Pardon me? When did they find the victim's two, body? 2012, I think it was. Yeah, it was two, more, two years after the murder. Um, so does it matter what the police knew or what they said to him? Well, at both. Um, I think it matters what it, they It matters knew. more what they said to him because, because they, they led him into that question. They asked him things they confronted him after they confronted exactly. him. But exactly. that wasn't, that wasn't uh, all that uh, was involved in the August 3rd or the August 5th interview. In fact, he was the one who requested the August 5th interview. He did. He went there voluntarily. And Judge Rufo said, basically, lo he, Judge Rufo said that everything should have come in, almost everything should have come in up, up until the moment that they told him that they knew where he was that night. And then he started making uh, excuses and um, lying, basically. I guess what everyone's saying, just to make, make a simple point, is that um, just because the police bring up the gun at the uh, August 3rd interview mm -hmm. after they have the CLSI is not a reason that you don't consider the gun when you're determining whether or not there's an independent source mm -hmm. because they didn't get that information from the CLSI. That's, that's right, and, that's, and if they got it from the CSLI, they, they, they shouldn't be using but it. But they didn't. They didn't get the gun information from the Well, CLSI. they, they asked him. At that, at that point, they were asking him, and they, they wouldn't have known the questions to ask, I don't think. Um, Why not? Well, that, perhaps. Um, there were a number, I mean, I went, out and I went on at length in my, um, well, he was, in my he was, brief he was, about... He was certainly a suspect. I mean, they had many, many telephone calls. That's right. Between the, the, the victim and him immediately before she disappeared. So mm -hmm. uh, well, he, I was he, was cuts... certainly, he was certainly somebody who they, and he was believed to be the father of her, ch of her child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they had reason to think that he had wanted the child to be aborted. So he was very much a suspect, wholly apart from the CSLI. Correct. And wasn't there also no, you're, you're absolutely warrant? right. Except that I think some of that cuts both ways. The fact that uh, they were having a relationship and they did talk many, many times—not just that day, but every day—and um, just because he was the father of her baby, I, I just don't think that that's enough to make to have a motive for murder. Um, in my brief, I talk about motive for murder. In, it's often a motive for murder. Well, it, it 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 could be, but I don't think it's enough. Um, I, I for what though? Because they don't need any enough to talk to him. Exactly. So it's enough for what? It doesn't have to be enough for anything. The issue is whether or not they are able to bring up the firearm in the discussion because mm -hmm. of the CLSI. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Easterbrook makes clear, not that you need Easterbrook to make it clear, that if they have the information independent of the CLSI, the CLSI information isn't impacting the interrogation. As to oh, that's exactly right. Uh, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, but, uh, we, we speak about the CSLI. Uh, does he have standing to challenge the CSLI search of the mm -hmm. victim's phone? No, I don't think he does. I think so. It's also oh, the victim's phone CSLI is fair game. It is, and it, it is. So I it's everybody else's. I so it's only it's only his which only is his, at issue. It's only his that he's challenging exactly. Uh, but there were two other people with serious motives to uh, to murder this victim, and they were both. Uh, she was married to both of them, contemporaneously married to both of them at the same time, and the first one was the man that she came with. Um, to to, uh, to the hotel, which is he, she he had paid her twenty thousand dollars to marry him, and they came uh, they were on they were on their way to a Boston interview at the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Services um, so that he could get you know so that he could become a citizen, and um, he, Mr. Ramal, pardon me, Ramal yeah. exactly, Ramal Ramal. Exactly. I mean, in the, in the last minute, she could have asked for more money uh, from him. She could have reneged that she was helping him the next day. He had, he had, uh, he had motive to murder her. And his, his behavior uh, during this time was, was unusual. Um, he oddly answered when, he was, when the police asked him, um, did he ever give her money? He oddly said that when they got married, he didn't give her money, you know, as though he were, as though he were lying about that. Um, well, wasn't he tr hoping to get a citizenship? I mean, it's, it doesn't help he, yeah, exactly. if it's you to be a, 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 a bogus marriage if the purpose is to get citizenship. Yeah. The fact yeah. that you paid somebody to marry you is not a good start on that road. It's, it's, exactly, exactly. But the other things that he said... Didn't, were, didn't we have his CSLI data? 
And didn't it show that his phone was only used in the vicinity of Hyannis during late evening hours, as the 27th and the early morning hours of the 28th? Don't we know that he wasn't, he wasn't according to his CSLI, that he was anywhere near where the murder took place? That, that he who, was not. Who, Griselle Wilson? Rimmel. Oh, Rimmel, yes. And I, I think that's true, because they did have his CSLI. Okay. They had his CSLI, they had um, yeah. Masato's CSLI, who was on Nantucket, they had Sinise, yeah. and he was located in West Yarmouth. So they had these people that you think These are, other people, yeah. 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 Um, the other things, too, is that he, uh, the, the, Ramel had her room key, and he, he checked out of both rooms. He saw that she wasn't there. He checks out of both rooms, and he returns his key, and then a little while later, he comes with her key. Well, the night before, she had told him that she was going to Staples to make copies, and she surely would have taken her key, so he so somehow... So this argument, though, I mean, the only, tell me if I'm, uh, there's some other point to this argument other than saying that uh, there was unfair resulting prejudice from the admission of the mm -hmm. CLSI. That's mm -hmm. all the, that's, that's what we consider the that's, third party that's, culprit. That's true, that's true, that's true. Um, her other husband not only had a uh, motive to kill her, but he also um, wanted his money. Who, who was his name, please? His name was, uh, he had a very unusual name. It was three or four names, but they called him Terry uh, McDowell. Okay. And um, he wanted his money back, and he wanted, he, she, he had paid her $4,000 to marry him, and he wanted the money back. Um, and he went to her parents and said basically that uh, he'll do whatever it takes to get, to get the money back, and that people do a lot less, a lot, you know, for a lot less money than this, people do things like kill her. Um, so not only did he have a murder, he was, he was basically threatening. Um, so these two people perhaps would have been um, would have been investigated thoroughly by the police. Did the jury hear that? Um, no, that was from police reports. The uh, motion for a new trial judge had that. But of um, course, the question is, how would McDowell know where she that she was at a hotel in Hyannis? That how, how would pardon me? I know that why I know that Renal would know that she was at a hotel in Hyannis, and I know that the defendant would know that she was at a hotel right, right. in Hyannis. But, but how, I don't how know would how. McDowell know? Were there any telephone calls between McDowell and her before she died? I don't know that answer. Okay, so he would have to be surveilling her to know that she was actually... No, that's true. That's true. <clears throat> that's absolutely true. Um, let's see. So I basically it comes down to our analysis of Judge... Rufo's, Judge Rufo's taint analysis. Yes, exactly. And um, he basically uh, said that the, the tainted evidence which came in was really not prejudicial because it was really a consciousness of guilt evidence. And I would suggest it was prejudicial, prejudicial and it shouldn't, shouldn't have come in. He also said there was an independent source for a lot of it. Independent source for some of it, yes, yes. You're not challenging the search warrant that was executed on the fifth of the house, are you? I, I was, um, because... Um, they, had, they already knew a lot of... Well, they, they it's, put it it's in the search warrant affidavit? There was an affidavit. I know, but did they, did they reference the CSLI in there? Um, good question. I'd have to look it again, but I, I think they did. They did. Um, Going back to your taint analysis, mm -hmm. the attorney below, the defense attorney below, moved to suppress, but did not move to suppress the fruits... Exactly. So the claim is that he was ineffective, or she, I forget, was ineffective for failing to do so. And so when Judge Rufo is analyzing it, he's using the Safarian standard to mm -hmm, evaluate. Mm -hmm. And I think he does find that counsel was ineffective in failing to make that motion. Yes, yeah, he does, some of it, uh, yes. So, and he's using the Safarian standard. We'd have to use a substantial likelihood Mm -hmm. standard because this mm -hmm. is a murder case. Mm -hmm. exactly. uh, so why, I know that there were things he said which came in which shouldn't have, but the question for us then is whether there's a substantial likelihood of miscarriage of justice arising from the admission of the tainted evidence. Of the tainted evidence. And so does it, why does it rise to that level at where Judge Rufo, in a very, very careful opinion, found that it did not? I think it rises. He used a somewhat different standard, but it's an analogy. Exactly, standard. exactly. I think it rises to that um, level because, I mean, for one thing, I have a couple of a couple of uh, issues with his findings, particularly the, uh, the, the uh, untainted findings. Um, 
but I think it rises to the level of substantial risk of miscarriage of justice just because he paints the defendant in such a bad light. Um, he's basically lying and lying and lying, and um, he comes across as you know guilty rather than not guilty. And I think if, if there was no CSLI, um, he would not have been found guilty. Um, and I think it should not have come in. Well, the issue is not whether there would be CSLI unless if we find that the second search warrant was sufficient and did not rely upon. Is your claim that the second search warrant relied upon tainted information? The, um, the uh, well, it, it does rely on tainted information because it relies on, to some extent, on the, uh, the gun information. Um, they found in the house, they found, uh, they found a lot of stuff in the house and they found um, that came in. Um, but in particular, they found a lot of the, um, the gun manuals, the, um, the gun, uh, they didn't find the gun, but they did find all kinds of things that went with the gun. Um, so that was the main, the main thing. But, but then the you'd house. have to show us that the search of the house was tainted. But I yes. don't know that you've shown, have you, have you argued that or have you shown us that? I think I did, I did, did argue that. Okay, and, and why is the search of his apartment tainted? By the CS, the earlier CSLI. Um, it's because uh, I think because they they knew what they what they learned from the CSLI. I believe that they used to to get the uh, the second search warrant for the house and also for his cars and also for um, his motorcycle. Did the second search warrant did I'm sorry did it the did, oh, search did. warrant affidavit for the apart for his apartment include CSLI? I, I I've not looked back to it. I'd have to go back to it and look for sure. Yeah, I don't think Judge Rufa found that it did. He found that that, that search was untainted, What didn't okay. he? I think that's right. Did the um, fetus uh, and the DNA on the fetus and mm -hmm. indicating to a high mathematical number that the defendant was the father, was that in the second um, um, affidavit? I don't think so. I don't think so. But that would be a factor nonetheless if it you It was a factor. The jury knew that, yeah. Thank you, and I'll rest on my brief if there are no more questions. Okay, thank you. Ms. Sweeney. Good morning, may it please the court, Elizabeth Sweeney for the Commonwealth. The touchstone of the exclusionary rule is reasonableness, and in 2010, police obtained a 2703D order. They complied with the law when they had a signed court order for the defendant CSLI. What Did should we make of the fact that it was done orally? If you review 18 U.S.C. 2703D pre-Carpenter, <clears throat> there's no, um, no requirement that it's done via an affidavit or even orally. After Carpenter, 2703D was amended to state that it should comply with state law. So reading strictly 2703D back in 2010, it doesn't state that there was a requirement that it should have been in writing. I reviewed um, the transcript briefly to see if the uh, trooper gave a sworn statement to the judge. It's my understanding that he did, at least my interpretation in, in working on this case. I can't find the exact site for you. <coughs> I know that he, Trooper Matt Lavoie, testified that he orally conveyed the facts of the case twice, uh, August 2nd to Judge O'Neill and again on August 3rd, 2010 to Judge O'Neill. But if we forget about the exclusionary rule and the good faith exception, aren't you all right? Um, with, uh, with Judge Rufo's analysis? I, or are I'm you thinking that's inadequate in some ways? We are because he denied it the is. defendant's motion for new trial. He's satisfied with it. However, he, he was did, right. He did find that there was evidence that was tainted because it was obtained derivatively from the 2703D order. So if this court was to adopt the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule, that finding would be set aside. Okay, but well, do you need to have it set aside to win? No. Okay. But I don't want to concede that okay. any evidence was tainted by the D order in 2010 because law enforcement complied with the law in 2010. And in 2014, when Augustine was issued, myself and the first assistant sat down and obtained a search warrant for the same CSLI before the defendant filing a motion to suppress as the law developed. So there's no misconduct. There's no deterring rationale to suppress or to find that the CSLI should not have been used because the Cape and Islands DA's office, along with law enforcement, complied at every stage as cell phone evidence well, let's, has let's developed. Let's assume otherwise. Let's assume otherwise. And uh, but go on to uh, ask you the question about the search warrant that uh, Justice, Chief Justice Gantz was asking about, the search warrant of the house. So what the kind of affidavit was there? Was there CSLI information in that affidavit? 
The search warrant of the house did include CSLI information. It also included the CDRs, the call detail records. It included the statements about the defendant owning a firearm. It included the statements from Mwande Sinene stating on August 2nd prior to the police obtaining the CSLI that the defendant had a firearm. So there, if you exclude the CSLI from the 2703D order, which I am not conceding that there was an issue with that, there's still probable cause to search the house, to search the car. Could you, um, could you car. help me with where in the record is that? I can't find that. Could you handle me? I briefly just looked at, I believe it's in volume one of my appendix on pages 58 and 59. Okay, thanks. And that search warrant was basically um, the same facts, same set of facts used for the, for the motorcycle, the house, and the car. But going back to my argument briefly about the good faith exception, I just want to make it clear that law enforcement in this case complied with the laws it developed. And this case is an outlier. I'm not asking for this broad, sweeping good faith exception to, to come to Massachusetts, but I want the court to know that it's a very narrow exception that I'm asking for. The facts of this case, uh, there was no way to foresee that the law would change. And as it changed, the Commonwealth complied with it. What about the defendant's point that if, because an incremental step might turn into another step, and that um, this is not really a circumstance to adopt the good faith exception because there's just a dwindling amount of these cases that would be impacted, and as Justice Link was just suggesting, you know, Judge Rufo's got a solid uh, opinion there that, that just might do it anyway. Judge Rupo does have a very solid opinion. However, he also found that the good faith exception is consonant with justice. And I don't think that we should consider the number of cases. The defense counsel stated it was a fi is a finite number. I know myself that right now there are cases that this issue um, would be relevant to on appeal and currently being prosecuted. And I don't think that we should consider the number of cases. I think that actually even tips the scale towards adopting the exception for in drafting a very narrow, finite exception for cell phone location information mm -hmm. where 2703D was complied with and then law enforcement complied with Augustine prior to any motions or anything being filed. There's no deterring value. We're not learning anything from excluding this evidence. It's not going to happen again. We um, complied well, as the law developed. Can, can I ask a, a sort of a related argument? I, I'm quoting from the uh, the defendant's brief. Were Easterbrook extended, the court would be sanctioning a procedure that is an affront to the Fourth Amendment in Article 14. Imagine this scenario in a more common search and seizure context. Without a warrant, officers search a person's home, seize incriminating evidence to be used at trial, then prior to trial, go to court to then obtain a search warrant and then research the person's home. I'm just, I'm trying to get a sense of whether the, say you don't have good faith, um, but it seems like the defense is sort of worried that these researches themselves are real problems. What do you, what's your reaction to that? It's not a re research as you would. Well, just well, you've got an illegal search followed by a subsequent search. There, there's. What well, then you? we're just applying the independent source doctrine. This case is very factually similar to Estabrook when drafting the opposition to the motion to suppress and the motion for new trial, Estabrook was going on at that same time. So given the primary illegality of the 2703D order, the issue is whether the 2014 warrant for the static information, the business records that were preserved under 2703F, if there was independent probable cause. And Judge Rufo correctly found that there was um, based on the um, defendant's statements that he, he made, the calls from the victim to the defendant and vice versa on the day that she was missing and um, the evidence of their relationship. So I don't think that this case would, um, is kind of, it's falling in between the cracks of Augustine and Estabrook and there is an independent source for the CSLI. So well, I, I see defense counsel's concern, but it doesn't rise to that level. Well, all, all that's really happening is this information existed um, and the police had it before the August 3rd interview. Yes. It still exists in the exact same form, and if they didn't use anything or they didn't need anything to get probable cause um, from what they obtained before, 
in, in, in the new search warrant, if you excise everything out that in any way might be related to um, the, they didn't know it at the time, unconstitutional uh, search, and you still have probable cause, then there's no issue. Exactly. That's except, exactly what I'm saying. Except for there's no penalty either. So you, I, I, I understand this is not a good case because they acted in good faith. Yes. But, but it, in the context where there's, a, say, a bad faith search and you get stuff, there's no penalty for if you redo it a second time, right? You just don't, you're not getting to use the information, but there's absolutely no penalty for the illegal search, right? But this, this was not I'm illegal. not talking about this case. I'm talking about a bad faith search. If you got a bad faith search, I'm just, this may support your argument for good faith exception. Right. So you got a bad faith search, then you get to redo it, but there's no penalty. Um, Cause you get- not to interrupt, sorry. Go ahead. The, the records in this case are static information and they were preserved. Mm -hmm. So it's not as though, as defense counsel argued, you're going in a house, searching it, coming back out, getting a warrant and researching it. They're static records that were preserved in the same form. I, I understand. I'm more concerned about the bigger picture point, which is if you're, does Easterbrook somehow, I understand in a good faith context, it's fine. In a, it's just I'm wondering whether the defense has a point in a bad faith second search that unless you bring a Bivens action, there's nothing the police are, there's no penalty to the police for doing it twice. But again, we're getting off point. Where would the bad faith be where the court, the Commonwealth is following the rules as the rules change for I'm the game? I'm not positing your case. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps the answer or the, or the question or the answer is, would the second search be, would the probable cause for the second search rely in any way on tainted evidence from the first bad search? You, you couldn't use couldn't tainted use evidence it. in the search warrant that you were arguing I, I for the get bad it. faith. I get it, but the problem so, is the police get to do it over again with no consequence to them. Uh, well, and the purpose to have a consequence would be for a deterring rationale, which I think supports my argument of adopting the good faith because there is no reason to deter misconduct where there was none. There's competing interests between deterring misconduct and also furthering the Commonwealth's argument in convicting the guilty. And we are somewhat in between, I get it. especially with cell phone evidence in this decade of ever developing case laws they are trying to stay up to date on it. And, there's, and the Commonwealth did that in this case. So, so uh, if I can go back to this 2703, there's a standard for 2703. Yes. If there's no writing, how is there to be an evaluation? There's no writing, there's no recording. How is there to be an evaluation as to whether the standard was met except by having the person testify to what he told the judge? Is that what you say the law for 2703 is, is that there's no obligation for any writing? I know the statute appears to be silent on it, but I don't, I, I've never seen a 2703 case without, a, without an application in writing. There, there are cases without an application in writing. Going back to 2010, to that standard of 2703D, yes, at the time, in, in reading this it strictly, um, Judge Nickerson did find that and adopt the um, statements that Trooper Lavoy told Judge O'Neill. Trooper Lavoy orally conveyed those in the motion to suppress to Judge Nickerson, and um, the, Judge Nickerson did not allow the defendant's motion to suppress the CSLI. Are you said there are cases which have said, uh, uh, no, or, there are no, is okay. I was going to say, but I mean, pragmatically, if you're a defense counsel and you see a 2703 order and there's no <coughs> affidavit, you're, you would have to file a motion to suppress and then it would have to be based on the oral testimony of the affiant? Yes. That's all you'd have. And if the affiant had died, you would have nothing. However, in 2010, again, there was no requirement in either federal or Massachusetts law, how to convey the specific and articulable facts. The standard was less than it is now, and the law enforcement complied with that. Now, would I have an officer do that? Absolutely well, not. We would you, get a warrant. You said there was no standard, but I mean. No, I, no rule I, as far I, as. I, I know that the statute appears to be silent. There's no case which says it's okay. This would be the first case to say it's okay. 
this would be the first case to say it's okay. And I think that that tips the scale also in the Commonwealth's argument for adopting good faith exception because the trooper clearly read the statute strictly and Judge O'Neill, who signed off on the August 3rd, 2010, 2703D order, also would see that statute and found that the Commonwealth had met its burden, specific and articulable facts, to obtain the defendant's CSLI. But actually, isn't this a good case for not dealing with it at all? Because Judge Rufo's decision avoids the problem altogether. You don't need the, even the CSL, even the 2703 doesn't matter, right? It, it doesn't matter. Nothing how, matters because as long as it's not tainted. Exactly. But Judge Rufo did find that there were portions that were connected to the um, initial D order. But he also found that it was without consequence, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. And he found, again, inevitable discovery. He addressed um, the independent source doctrine, and Commonwealth right. completely agrees with that. Right. However, as I opine in my brief, there's no misconduct by law enforcement in this case. Okay. Commonwealth complied with the laws it developed. Judge Rufo correctly um, found the Commonwealth acted in good faith and also correctly denied the defendant's motion for new trial when he found and adopted the inevitable discovery and independent source under Estabrook. So what? either way, the Commonwealth succeeds, but it's a good case to demonstrate the cell phone cases that fall between the cracks of 2703D in Augustine and the issues that prosecutors and law enforcement are grappling with when we deal with these cases as they come up on appeal. Is it uh, fair to say there may be future issues we cannot contemplate involving technology changes? Absolutely, and I personally know from cases I'm involved in, there will be more coming your way. I was say, you appear, to, you appear to be worried about something other than this case. <laughs> uh, but Both sides. whether or not this is the case to do it, we'll have to consider. One question not raised. Is there evidence as to how the defendant purportedly got back from the Exit six <laughs> parking area. I assume this is. I, I assume he was. I assume she was found in the area off of exit six, which is sort of where the buses come. Are you saying the victim found? The victim, there? yeah. No, the victim was found in Hayway Road. No, um, no, not not the victim. I'm sorry, the victim's car. The victim's car was found there. Um, okay. No, the record is silent as to that. So, and how far is that from the defendant's home? Uh, um, I'd say ten minutes. Centerville to ten minutes driving. Yes, Centerville so, so, to the um, to the plaza. So. And, there, and there was no evidence as to how, assuming the defendant was driving with her, killed her, dumped her body, and then left, and then parked there. We don't know how the defendant got home unless he sort of. It's a pretty fair walk, I would think. Well, we have his CSLI that shows the um, defendant meeting up with the victim in that parking lot. He. The CSLI shows that he leaves and goes all the way down to East Falmouth, which is a, a hike, it's a drive from right. Centerville, and then um, ends up calling his wife at 11, 11 p.m. on that evening, and it hit a short tower, which is 0.6 <coughs> miles from where the victim's body was found two years later, and then headed back up 28 in the service road, cut over by Route 6, and ended up heading back home to Centerville. So that's the information that we have. Yes, he has no car, right? His he has a motorcycle. He had the um, the Ducati motorcycle and a truck. Oh, I'm so, not sure so, which so vehicle he, he was. potentially could have met her there. Yes. And then driven her to the location, then killed her, and then driven back. Yes. Okay. But, and, and is that, do, do we know that, or is that just by inference from the CSLI? That's inference from the CSLI and your statements to me about how it could have possibly Because he said out. the motorcycle was not working, which is why he, but we don't know whether that's true or not. Exactly. There are no further questions. I rest on my brief. Thank you. Okay, thank you.